Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello, welcome to today's presentation, Robotic Assisted Knee Replacement, presented by Dr. Bryant Bonner, orthopedic surgeon with Washington Hospital's Institute for Joint Restoration and Research. And now, please welcome Dr. Bonner. Hi everyone, Great. good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to join me in my discussion today about robotic assisted total knee replacement. As mentioned, my name is Brian Bonner. I'm a new hip and knee surgeon here at uh, Saw Orthopedic Associates here at the Institute for Joint Replacement. So first, just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Sacramento, the home of the Kings, not too far from here. Um, I went back east thinking it would be a four-year stint, uh, but I ended up spending around 15 years back east. I did my college, undergrad, uh, my medical school, as well as my orthopedic surgery residency training, all at Harvard. Um, I made my way a little bit closer west uh, and did a fellowship training in hip and knee replacement in Salt Lake City, and then was fortunate enough to join Saw Orthopedic Associates here at the Institute for Joint Replacement in 2021. And so here's a guide of a little bit about what we're going to discuss today, including osteoarthritis, um, the OA, the arthritis treatment pathway, when, to how, when and how we decide on when uh, the timing is right for joint replacement surgery, the ins and outs of a basic knee replacement surgery, as well as the exciting new uh, robotic-assisted total knee replacement technology we have here at the Institute for Joint Replacement. And then finally, just a brief segment about what it's like to have your joint replacement here done at the Institute for Joint Replacement. So first, a little bit about arthritis. So arthritis uh, describes a loss of cartilage from joint surfaces or the ends of bones that move against each other. And so it is the, uh, a number of different types, including inflammatory, things like rheumatoid, psoriasis, or trauma if you have a fracture or an injury. All of that can cause arthritis, but the most common form of arthritis is what we know as osteoarthritis. And that's just standard wear and tear of the joint as we get older. Um, and arthritis comes from a Greek word meaning inflammation of the joint and is by far the most common cause of chronic joint pain. In the U.S. alone, it's estimated that around 80% or more of folks over the age of 65 have some evidence of osteoarthritis on x-ray, but only about 60% of those patients have signs and symptoms. And so arthritis is typically a slow and progressive uh, process, and it starts here on the left in stage one and evolves all the way to stage four, which you saw in those x-rays right before. And so the, usually the, the earliest changes that occur are these surface level, superficial, what we call fibrillations or irregularities of the cartilage surface or those smooth gliding surfaces at the ends of bones that form our joints. And so these slowly begin to progress. They become deeper and become, start to expand across the joint. As you see, we progress from stage one to stage two. And then at stage three, uh, we have even more of that progression and uh, of the, the cartilage erosion and expansion. And now we have some joint space narrowing as well as bone spurs. And then eventually we get to stage four in which we have bone on bone arthritis. Um, and that is uh, when we start to consider and talk about potentially doing an intervention, something like a joint replacement, which we'll talk a little about more in a second. So as I mentioned, the most common form of arthritis in all comers is what we call osteoarthritis, and that is generally just wear and tear, that which we progressively grind away the cartilage of the joints, uh, and that changes the underlying bone. So this is a very slow and progressive process, as I've uh, just highlighted. It gets worse over time, and unfortunately that joint damage is, tends to be irreversible. So the, the causes of it tend to be multifactorial and there's an interplay of different things. Um, as I mentioned, most commonly is age, that wear and tear from time. Uh, sex, it tends to affect women at a greater rate than men. Genetics, so if your parents or grandparents had arthritis, there's a high chance that you too may have some element of arthritis in your lifetime. And excess weight, so any extra pound that we have across our whole body is a multiplier that our hip and knee joints see, so around five to seven pounds across our hip and knee joints for every one pound total that we have. 
The symptoms of arthritis are many, but they include pain, stiffness, swelling, uh, warmth, as well as what we call deformity. So in knees in particular, we might notice that you're starting to become more knock-kneed or bow-legged over time, and that is a sign of your arthritis progressing in one area of the knee more than the other. And so why is arthritis becoming so prevalent? And so the American population is getting older, and most, a lot of Americans are getting heavier too. And so um, being overweight is a clear risk factor for, for developing arthritis. It increases the risk in four times in women and five times in, in men. In addition, folks who are diagnosed with diabetes also have a two times more likely chance to have arthritis, suggesting a link between those two as well. Arthritis tends to be a clinical diagnosis and can be diagnosed with confidence if a number of different things are present, including if you have pain worse with activity and better with rest, if you're, eight, if you're older than 45 and have morning stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes, if you have bony joint swelling or enlargement, and uh, if you have a limitation in your range of motion or stiffness. Fortunately, this tends to be a clinical diagnosis, and so we can diagnose this most of the time with your patient history, the physical exam, and x-rays tend to be our bread and butter. There are some other tools that we have at our, at our disposal that can help with our diagnosis, but including MRI, CT, things like an arthrocentesis, which is where we take some fluid off of the joint, or arthroscopy or a scope. But really, the bread and butter is our history, exam, and our x-rays. The treatment goals for arthritis are really to minimize both pain and functional loss. And so we always start with non-operative treatment first, and the things that we try first are things like exercise and physical therapy. These are to help maintain and increase the range of motion and strength in and around your joints. This can be formal or informal exercises to help with your joint mobility and strengthening. Sometimes you can modify some of your activities to help with that pain and discomfort. And then there are alternative therapy, therapies like acupuncture or supplements or chiropractor. In addition, there are medications that we can trial as well that may help with some pain, and these include things like Tylenol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Those are things like ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Celebrex, Mobic. There's a lot of them, all of which are, are targeting inflammation and pain, um, and that includes things like topical pain medication. The most common is diclofenac, or known, also known as Voltaren, and that is an, a great alternative for patients who can't tolerate oral uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, usually because of abdominal or stomach discomfort. And so you can rub that directly on the area of pain or discomfort. And then if the pain is not significantly relieved by these pain medications or not providing enough relief, then we can talk about potential injections, which include cortisone, which is a steroid, which can also help tamp down the local inflammation and swelling, or things like hyaluronic acid, also known as rooster comb or joint lubricant, all of which should hopefully help with the mobility and pain control of that joint. And as already mentioned before, every pound of weight that we have across our whole body adds a multiplier of, of weight across our hip and knee joints. So losing you know, every 10 pounds, you lose 50 pounds of stress across both your hip and knee joints. So what happens when those pharmacological and, and lifestyle interventions are not providing enough symptomatic relief? Um, and so you know, it's at an unacceptable level, then we can start to talk about next steps and potential surgical options. And so these are three uh, common ones. And so arthroscopy is not a huge part of our joint uh, arthritis treatment, but we'll highlight it briefly. But these two things like partial joint replacement and total joint replacement are two big mainstays in our field, which we'll get into in more detail. So arthroscopy is really meant for the small cartilage injuries or meniscus tears. And so if you have bad arthritis, this is typically not the right option for you. And so these can be useful, like I said, in those very isolated cartilage or meniscus tears. And we use a small little camera to go in and take a look and we can trim uh, any loose frayed cartilage or uh, meniscus tears. The downside is if you already have arthritis and we're trimming away some of that cushioning, the meniscus in between the two joint surfaces, that runs the potential of of making that arthritis worse. And so it's not a huge mainstay and, and if you already have arthritis treatment. Partial joint replacement is a great option in the right candidate. This is where we, uh, you only have arthritis and pain in only one area of the joint. And so in that case, we just resurface or put a cap on the area of the both the femur and the tibia and a piece of plastic in between. 
uh, of the one area of the joint that has pain and discomfort. It's great because there's bone and ligament preservation, tends to be less invasive, and these folks uh, tend to have better range of motion right off the bat and recover pretty quickly. The problem is it has to be done in the right candidate. So if you have arthritis in more than one area of the knee, uh, this is not the right option for you because you're not gonna get the pain relief that you need. And the reason that these things uh, fail is not because the metal and plastic fail, it's because you tend to develop arthritis in other areas of the knee. And when that happens, then we can start to talk about changing this from a partial to a total. And so what is a total joint replacement? And so this is when arthritis begins to involve most or all of the joint space. And so if you can see here, if I can find my mouse somewhere, Yep, here on the left. So this image here on the left is your knee joint. So this is your femur or thigh bone, your tibia or shin bone, your kneecap is up here above. This white area represents your joint space and you can see that joint space is really taking a beating and so it is pretty worn down on both the femur and the tibial side. And so what we do is we resurface these areas of, of worn or damaged cartilage and remove that meniscus. And so I think total knee replacement actually needs a rebrand uh, because it's not so much a replacement as is a resurfacing. And so it's like putting a new cap on a tooth. And so you can see these new covers on both the femur and the tibia and that piece of plastic in between to replace that uh, bone on bone. So it helps to reestablish the joint mechanics. And so the most important factor in choosing how, when to have a joint replaced is how much it hurts and how much is affecting your daily life. And so here are a couple signs and signals that it might be time to consider having your joint replaced. And so you start having enough pain and discomfort and limitation that you're not able to complete your routine daily task without help, uh, whether it be uh, manual assistance from friends or family or pain medication requirements. If you have a lot of pain, pain that keeps you up at night, that is real true pain, despite uh, medications like the Tylenol and ibuprofens that we've talked about before. Um, you know, the pain that's not relieved by rest or, you know, you've tried injections and it's just not improving. If your primary care or family doctor says that looking at your x-rays you have arthritis and things like a less complicated surgical procedure, something like a scope as we highlighted, you know, just trimming the, a torn meniscus or frayed cartilage here is probably not going to provide you that pain and relief that you're looking for. Um, if you have known arthritis on x-ray and you start to feel that it's not only wearing you down physically but also emotionally and mentally because you're not, only, not able to do the things that you once enjoyed and would like to pursue. If you start having side effects from some of the medications that you're taking, as I already mentioned, some of the non steroidal anti-inflammatories can cause abdominal discomfort and pain. And if that happens because you're taking so much to get through the day, that may be a time to consider a potential joint replacement. And again, if you have any x-rays or MRIs or CTs that show advanced arthritis and significant joint damage, it is again, another sign to potentially consider uh, a knee replacement surgery. So let's talk about this a little bit more in detail and see a demonstration of what exactly that entails. So briefly, just the quick anatomy of the, of the, of the knee joint itself it typically consists of three bones. And so you have your thigh bone or your uh, femur, you have your tibia or your shin bone, and this right here in the middle is your patella or your kneecap. So these three bones are the ones that allow your, your knee joint to, to work. Um, it's held together with muscles, ligaments, these tendons. We, you talk about your MCL over here and your LCL over here. We don't see your quad above here, um, but all of that is your knee. And so what causes your knee pain? So you can see uh, on the left here is a healthy knee, and you can see this nice clear white cartilage, um, and that is a uh, nice smooth gliding surface and in between you have that meniscus which acts as a nice cushion and gliding surface for the two to allow it to work without pain. And on the right here again you see that diseased knee so the wear and tear has torn up that meniscus and that natural cushion between those two different bones. And so now you have bone on bone contact leading to inflammation, pain, and swelling. And so how does a knee replacement work? And so in this video here we get a good glimpse of exactly what we're going to be working with here. So here on the, on the left here, you see your femur or thigh bone, your tibia or shin bone, and your kneecap, just to orient you. So this is your knee joint itself. And so we're going to skip ahead. And so you can see that knee joint move in there. And these are examples of the components that we're going to be used, those resurfacing components, like I mentioned before, the cap on the tooth. And so the way it works is 
In the operating room, we'll remove those areas of diseased bone, so it's around 9 to 10 millimeters. And then we'll put on a new cap on both the femur and the tibia, and on the back of the patella or the kneecap as well. And there you go. You've got a new knee. And so that brings us to the exciting robotic technology that we have here at the uh, Saw Orthopedic Associates and Institute for Joint Replacement. Um, and so if you're like me, you see these articles all the time, and hopefully uh, your mom isn't emailing like she is me, asking if I'm going to be replaced by a robot. And so the big question, though, at the end of the day is, are these robotic surgeries really better? Um, but first, we have to take a step back and talk about what exactly is a robot. So, uh, like our friend Wally here, it's a reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator. So it's used to help move any sort of material, parts, tools, or specialized devices like saws or burrs through a variety of different program motions uh, to help us perform a task. And so robotics have been around for uh, quite a while now. The first time they were used in surgery was actually in 1985 when they used it to do a CT guided neurobiopsy, so a biopsy of the brain. Um, and that has continued to evolve. The first time they used a robot in orthopedic or bone surgery was in 1992, and it was actually in a joint replacement surgery. And this is the actual robot here. It was developed, it's called RoboDoc, developed by a company here in Fremont. Um, and so, but since then, uh, the, meal, the field of medical robotics has grown tremendously. And so there's a number of different robotic systems. Um, you know, we talk about the most common being the semi-active, which means that we create some boundaries or barriers for which the robot to work and assist us throughout the procedure. And so the way we do that is there's uh, three main ways. And so the one that we're going to talk about today is it helps us to perform some surgical cuts or resections by helping the saw go to a specified plane uh, from which we've uh, designed and planned during the procedure. Others help position a guide, so then we can use that guide to cut through or work through. And then the final is to position another tool of choice, an example of a burr, to help during the, the bone, the removing that diseased bone to put in the bony implant. And then the big other big divider between these systems is some require a preoperative image, so that's something like a CT to help with surgical planning and execution, while others are what we call image-free. And so this is what we have here at the Institute for Joint Replacement. Uh, this relies on us using interoperative anatomic landmarks so that are specific to you uh, in real-time planning. And the, good, the benefit of that is it decreases the cost, time, and radiation exposure for the patient. And, it, and all of the studies so far um, have failed to show that you know, preoperative imaging is necessary uh, to really uh, achieve the accuracy that all of these robotic systems seem to provide. So this is uh, what our robot actually looks like, and we'll see a demonstration of it later. And we'll talk about all the different components and, uh, and how it works. But the robotic-assisted knee replacement should hopefully help us and potentially provide us a precise knee implant that's tailored uh, to your unique patient anatomy. Because as mentioned, we're going to build that 3D model of your knee based on anatomic landmarks in the operating room. And uh, this technology is going to help us perform as close to a personalized knee replacement surgery as we hope to achieve um, to provide and improve your comfort and uh, overall experience after a knee replacement. And so again, here's, an, an, here's what the robotic arm looks like. Um, you have the, uh, one of the sensors here and the robotic arm here and our cutting tool here, our saw. And um, these, uh, the hopeful, the te this technology is hopefully provided, uh, will allow us to provide more predictable results uh, to help improve patient outcomes and hopefully increase mobility and hopefully help patients recover faster. Um, the way they do this is hopefully by allowing us to provide optimal knee implant positioning as well as personalizing the alignment and balance relative to your specific soft tissues. In addition, they provide some solid numbers on the overall balance and feel of the knee, which in the past has been pretty subjective and surgeon specific, but now we actually have the numbers to back up what the feeling of a nice and balanced knee is in our hands so that we can reproduce those results in the future, hopefully. And to boil it down, just to some key points here, uh, the potential benefits of a robotic-assisted knee replacement include that the surgery is specifically tailored to each patient based on their unique anatomy. And as mentioned, we use uh, tools in the operating room to create a 3D model that's unique to you and only you. 
Um, and the hope is that we are able to use increased accuracy and precision for these more consistent uh, outcomes. So accuracy refers to how close a measurement is to the target. So um, around here, so this is accurate, but not precise. And precision refers to how close measurements are to the same uh, item uh, or to each other. And so we want something that's both accurate and precise, like an image over here on the left. And that's our goal with a robotic assisted knee replacement. Further potential benefits of a robotic assisted knee replacement is that we hope that patients would experience less pain and faster recovery. We also may hope that it allows for a greater range of motion, less pain, and faster recovery times overall, including reduced length of stay, readmissions, and hospital visits. And as mentioned, this is an image-free system, so we don't have an added cost of a CT, so no additional cost um, for um, imaging or radiation exposure. And so the, a number of different studies have been performed and looked at a number of different robotic systems, including the one that we have here, which is called the VELUS, uh, which all seem to suggest that these robotic systems help to accurate, accurately uh, improve implant alignment, as well as uh, uh, a, a mechanical access, joint line placement, and the like. In addition, studies seem to suggest that uh, patients who have a robotic-assisted surgery tend to have, uh, hopefully, less uh, post-operative pain and opioid use, as well as improved early functional recovery. And in long term, these results seem to even out. But if you have that benefit of the early recovery, uh, we can get you a move in faster because we're always fighting against the buildup of scar tissue in knees because range of motion, range of motion, range of motion is the name of the game after our knee replacement. We want to try to get, maximize that before we get the buildup of too much scar tissue. And so the first six weeks is especially important in that, especially if, if you've had a knee, you, know, you remember. So here's an example of what the knee, the robot looks like here in the operating room. And so bear with me as I try to skip ahead. So you're going to have two trackers here, one for the femur or the thigh bone and one for the tibia or the shin bone. And so these are pins that go into your, uh, those bones here. And then this handheld device is a, is a stylus, which they all have these tracker uh, points on them. So we have these trackers, both in the femur or the thigh bone and the tibia or the shin bone. And they have these little digital trackers that the camera can see on the robot. And then you have a stylus that helps us create a 3D model of the knee during the procedure using interoperative anatomic landmarks, which again are specific to you and you alone. Using these trackers, we're able to get a real-time sense of the range of motion as well as the balance of the knee. And so this screen here uh, is one of our most important, and we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. This is our planning screen. So once we have that model of our knee and we've gone through the range of motion, uh, we can specifically name this knee for you. And uh, this robot is not connected to the internet. It's all HIPAA compliant. Um, and so this, as we go through the different ranges of motion, we can see the balance of the knee, how tight it is and how loose it is. And by altering these mechanics, you know, where are we gonna shift the implant a little more externally rotated or internally rotated, we can make a big difference in how that balance of the knee feels. Once we've made that plan, then we can start to make some bony cuts. And so you can see that here uh, with the robot. And so the robot uh, does not work without us. The surgeon has to have their hands on it at all times. Uh, without us operating that, that saw, it doesn't work. And so once we've made our cuts with the saw, then we have our implants that are now placed based on that plan that we've talked about. And so I might just go back one more time just to show you again. So once we've made our plan and decided on how we want to put in the implant to get our optimal balance and range of motion of the knee, the robot will then move the robotic arm into the correct plane to make the cuts for the plan that we planned. And so um, the robotic arm will swing into the, into the view here in a second. Um, and once it does, 
then we can make those cuts as we had planned. Once we make those cuts, we'll put in the implants and uh, we can really uh, get a sense of what that balance and range of motion of the knee is to make sure that we have the optimal outcome for you and that our good knee, our balanced knee that is uh, we feel in our hands matches the numbers that we see on the screen. And so this is an especially important tool um, for us to get that implant in the right place and in the planned place as we had planned. And so you can see with the surgeon there, um, it has to be, you have to be, I have to have my hands on it for it to work. So while the, the abundance of data does show that there is a lot of potential benefits of uh, a robotic assisted knee replacement, there are also some potential limitations of a robotic assisted knee replacement. The first of which is there's a learning curve. And so um, when there's a learning curve, there's increased surgical time for not only the surgeon, but the operating room staff learning the setup and breakdown and turnover of that robot. Now, fortunately for us, we've had this robot for over a year. And so now we're pretty well tuned and have a pretty well figured out. I also have had extensive robotic training experience on a number of different systems stemming back from when I was an orthopedic surgery resident uh, through my fellowship and now here, especially with the Velus robot, robot that we have here. Uh, as mentioned, that planning screen was the most important screen for me. And so we have to make sure that we have an accurate and uh, good operative plan before we make any cuts. So that is really up to the surgeon to make sure that they optimize that to really get that range of motion and balance of that knee uh, as, what they're, as what they intend. And then as mentioned, the, the studies that we have all tend to show pretty good outcomes, but they're pretty short term as far as the five to 10 years. And so we just need to continue to follow these patients and track the long-term outcomes uh, to further corroborate the short-term studies showing improved function and implant durability. And uh, at the moment, our current robot that we have here uh, works on total knee replacements only, but there is, we are currently uh, getting an update to work on partial knee replacements in the knee, near future as well. And then each robot is unique to each system, and so uh, each implant has their own robot. So you can't use one robot for a number of different implants if a patient had a specific preference. And so now let's just talk about briefly about what it's like to have a joint replacement here at Washington Hospital um, and, the, and the Institute for Joint Replacement. And I think this place is pretty unique in our preoperative education in which we run a preoperative class. This used to be in person, but now has moved online. And so it's a great session run by our PT, OT, and nurses uh, to go over what to expect before, during, and after your surgery. Um, and it seems to be very beneficial to our patients, both hip and knee, who attend. Um, all of our patients also get a preoperative binder with, uh, I joke, too much information in it. It's got anything and everything you could ever want to know about your hip and knee replacement um, and is a great uh, source for you throughout your uh, journey, both before, during, and after your joint replacement. And our staff here, so here is me and Dr. Saw. So we are fellowship trained surgeons. Our anesthesiologists are dedicated to us and the OR joint team. We have specialized OR techs and nurses, again, only for our joint teams. And our nurses here are dedicated to the uh, Institute for Joint Replacement along with our therapists. You know, this is all we do is hip and knee replacements. These are what are some of our clinic offices look like um, and uh, our single patient rooms here. So this is the nursing station and the different views that you can get. Every patient is, every room is single occupancy, so no sharing there. And I think what's really a testament to us here is that we're way down here in Fremont, but our catchment area or the area in which patients come to see us is from all over Northern California. And uh, we've gotten a number of different accolades, being awarded the number one orthopedic uh, facility in the country by the professional research consultants multiple years in a row. Becker's Hospital Review has also uh, credited us for a wonderful orthopedic program. In addition to health grades, which has given uh, the Institute for Joint Replacement five stars for both hip and knee replacements since 2002, uh, making us in the top 5% of the nation. In fact, we are even the number one joint replacement center here in California. And Consumer Reports, we all know Consumer Reports. Uh, we are very high rated for knee surgery. Um, and you can see over here on the left are some of our competitors in the area. And that red dot, uh, red circle with a dot suggests better. Uh, the blank circle is neutral, and you can see uh, that we're here at the top with that red dot. In addition, uh, we can see we're recognized for our knee surgery there, in addition to our hip surgery right here. All right. 
So thank you for your time and attention, uh, and I really appreciate it, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bonner. Yes, we do have some questions. The first question is, who is a candidate for robotic joint replacement surgery? We get this question all the time, and it's a good one. And uh, the good answer is, if you're a candidate for a knee replacement, you are also a candidate for a robotic-assisted total knee replacement as well. Um, and so we're happy to offer that to anybody who would like. Thank you. And our next question, how long is the hospital stay, and what is the total recovery time with knee replacement? Yeah. So most of our patients these days are going home the same day. Some are staying one night, uh, but most go home. Uh, you have home physical therapy for the first two weeks, so they come to you. And then after that two-week visit, you are then transitioned to outpatient physical therapy, so you go to there. So the first six weeks, as I mentioned, are very, very important. Uh, range of motion, range of motion, range of motion. That is the name of the game. So it's really PT heavy for those first six weeks. Um, then after that, uh, you are progressing your activity and strength. And so we expect the bulk of the recovery to happen within the first 12 weeks after. Okay. And then our final question, when should I see my doctor about knee replacement? Yeah, so as mentioned, pain and limitation of activities are sort of the biggest factors to consider when thinking about a joint replacement. And so when you start to have pain and discomfort, limitation in your range of motion that are starting to affect your quality of life and the things that you want to do or enjoy doing, that's the time to come see us. And we're happy to chat, go over your x-rays, and talk about both non-operative and operative solutions to work with you along the way. Okay, and this concludes our program. Dr. Bonner, we just want to thank you for being here and taking your time today for this insightful presentation, and thank you viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's presentation will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube.